Good morning. My name is Clayton Tatro. I'm the Associate Dean for Instruction here at Washburn Tech, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this morning. What a great day for a recognition and honor of great service. Please stand and remove head cover. For the, for the presentation of colors by the speaker ROTC. Hey, colors. Ready, cut, four, word, perch. Counter march. Included in the color guard is Dominic Rodriguez, a Washburn Tech student and member of the Student Activities Board. Okay. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, led by the Washburn Tech Little Learners and the singing of the National Anthem by Washburn Tech alumnus Jacinta Justice.
Thank you to our little learners. Thank you, Jacinta. That was beautiful. You may all be seated. As I said earlier, it is a great day to recognize great service. To the veterans in the room. Thank you. To those in active duty and in the National Guard. Thank you. To the families. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your service. Thank you for keeping this great nation safe and free. Some of us may never know the extent of the sacrifice and what you've done to keep this nation the greatest nation in the world. We appreciate you, we thank you, we honor you. I would like to also thank Lynn Dawson and Lori Hutchinson for their help in preparing and facilitating this ceremony as well. It is my pleasure now to introduce Barton Holman, who is the chairperson of the Student Activities Board. He's got a few comments to honor our veterans. Barton. Good afternoon. My name is Barton Holman. I am the chairperson of the Washburn Tech Student Advisory Board. It is my privilege to speak for a few moments as we honor our veterans on this day. The brave men and women who have served to protect the United States come from all walks of life. They are parents, they are grandparents, they are friends, they are neighbors, and they are co-workers, and an important part of our community. These veterans are a part of Washburn Tech community, and today we honor their service. It is one thing to talk about sacrifice, but it's another thing to live it. For those who have served in our families, for those who have served in the families who are left behind, we can only honor our ser honor your service and not presume to understand your reality. On this Veteran Day, let us remember the service of our veterans. Let us renew our national promise to our sacred our, to our sacred obligation to our veterans and their families as they have sacrificed so much that we can live free. Today, let us remember those who currently serve far away from their families. Let us remember those who paid the ultimate price in defense of our country. Let us remember those who returned from wars with scars that will never be healed. Let us thank our veterans who, for bravely doing what they called, what they were called to do so that we can live safely today and free. And let us honor our veterans who we have the privilege of knowing and working here at Washburn Tech. to introduce Brigadier General Deborah S. Rose. We're honored today to welcome Brigadier General Deborah Rose of the Kansas National Guard. General Rose entered military service with a direct mission into the United States Air Force Nurse Corps in 1983. She deployed overseas to both Saudi Arabia during Desert Shield and Afron, Turkey during the lead up to Operation Iraqi Freedom. In April 2002, she became the first female colonel in the Kansas National Guard. In 2004, she became vice wing commander until she was appointed as the first female brigadier general in the Kansas National Guard. General Rose served 14 years at Colomry O'Neill VA Medical Center in addition to many other postings and positions, including director of the Joint Staff Joint Forces Headquarters in Kansas. General Rose retired in 2011 after serving over 28 years. On November 5, 2017, she was inducted into the Kansas National Guard Hall of Fame. We are honored to have Brigadier General Deborah Rose speak with us on this important day. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today. 
I happen to be a Washburn University grad. I graduated from the School of Nursing back in 1982. Um, but I have to tell you, my new passion is Washburn Tech because I think you're doing phenomenal things here. Um, and I actually have a daughter-in-law attending and will graduate. So those are graduating in December, I will see you there. I'm so excited and I know Jessica is too. Today I'd like to talk to you about some of the lessons that military people learn from their service. And it's actually things that are very important to all of you who are in the civilian world and some things that you might um, want to hone up on so that you are better uh, employees, employers, and just overall good citizens. And everything I'm telling you today came off of the internet. So, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing. I can just Google whatever I want and it's amazing what I can find. But I, I want to tell you a few of the things that you will learn as you uh, serve your military. The other thing I'd like to say before I start that is, I don't know how many of you are aware, but only 1% of our population in the United States today is serving in the military. So when you think about the one versus the 99, it's that 1% that was willing to write a check to Uncle Sam that says, up to the amount of my life. And so it's, it, is, it is honorable to recognize all those people who have and are serving in the military. And I encourage young people, it's the best thing you could ever do in your life. So some of the things that you will learn if you serve in the military. The military instills some very high standards um, they require you to have personal grooming. You don't see people, and even women who have long hair have to put it up so it's not on their collar. Uh, you wear a uniform, you train, you train a lot, you, you do a lot of running and other physical activities, and you're assigned a job. And so why is any of that important at all? Well, the whole idea is how can you achieve the really big things in life if you can't handle the small ones. And it's all about attention to detail, discipline, and high standards in everything that you do. And these standards live with you for the rest of your life. So it's not something you learn in the military and put on a shelf. Now when you have to work and live with people 24 hours a day and seven days a week, there are probably going to be people that you just don't like. But you are a part of a team, so you have to learn how to develop a tough skin. You can't wear all your feelings on your cuffs. You have to build a tough skin, and you have to be able to take criticism. Because any of the people who've been through basic training will tell you that I think their drill instructors and drill sergeants probably relish the fact that they could yell at them and make them drop and, and do X amount of push-ups. But you really have to learn how to put on a tough skin and be able to take criticism. And you can argue and you can disagree, but you have to get over it. You can't hold a grudge. What do you think it would be like if you were serving in the military and, and in your group of people, you had a grudge against, somebody had a grudge against you, and, and you're in the middle of a heated battle and this person says well, I'm not going to help you I don't even like you anymore that's just not the way it works folks you have to be a part of the team and you have to be able to respect other people and other people's space so there will be people you don't like but you have to work with them I used to when I supervised people I I would have someone come in and say I don't like working with so-and-so and I don't like working with so-and-so my whole, my whole issue is, if you guys can't get along, you're both gone. It's there, you just can't run an organization and have people in conflict and disagreeing. It's bad for morale. From the very minute you enter the military, you serve on a team. You have, your team is the group that you belong to. And, and one of the purposes of a team is so that you self-regulate. So if somebody is falling behind, somebody's not keeping up, it's up to the team to bring that person into standards. 
And, you know, a team is not just a collection of individual people. It really kind of takes a, a has its own sense and its own purpose. But when you are a part of a team, sometimes you have to put aside your own, your own needs and strictly think about what the team needs. You want to help others, you want to help your teammates, and employers know when they hire veterans that they are going to be able to work and work in a team group. Military people learn quickly and they really have to. Now, in academia, where you are today, they have the ability to kind of stretch out courses, but in the military, time is money. They are paying you to learn, and you are going to learn as quickly as you can. So, for all of us, it's all about learning a new skill, and we become lifelong learners, and that's really something that you can adopt in your own life, because it really is important. Being responsible, you are accountable for all of your actions. And you can be punished if those actions are found to be um, not, not good or, or you did something that, that was really um, horrendous. But you are going to be held accountable. So you want to be dependable and you want to be reliable. You have to be able to work and lead Self-directed, and self-directed means that nobody's going to come over your shoulder and say, you have to do X, Y, and Z. You have to know your job, and you have to do your job. And you must have integrity. Integrity is all about doing the right thing, even when no one's looking. Think about that, doing the right thing, even when nobody's looking. And, and it's really about being conscious of what you're doing. Um, you have to tell the truth. You have to do your work. You have to do your fair share because remember you're a part of the team and you have to be accountable for your actions and mistakes. You know, college can be a lot of fun. I can promise you um, the first year when I was 17 and I went away to college, I had a whole lot of fun. Um, my grades reflected it. I had 36 hours and a .002 GPA. So I had a lot more fun than, than learning. Um, Fortunately, Washburn was willing to take me back after I was 10 years older, uh, although I had to soak up a lot of Fs. Uh, so I don't, that's not one of the courses of actions that I recommend. But the thing about college is it really doesn't teach you how to deal with stress, and the military does. Because in the military, you have deadlines, you have deployments, you have to balance your work, and your and your job sometimes military people have to work really really long hours i mean there you you go out for a training mission and you might work almost 24 hours a day for day after day military people have to work in very unfavorable working conditions when i think about those people who are in the middle east it is hot i was in saudi arabia during the fall i was there in october let me tell you, I have never been so hot in my life. So every time I think about what it feels like to be living in Kansas, I think about all of my brethren that are serving overseas in, in whatever kind of environment they are, because it's oftentimes not favorable. And then we have unfavorable politics that we, that we have to work under. And the stress of all of that, yet doing that with dignity, and that's exactly what our military folks do. They, they do all of this, but yet they, they keep their dignity. Now, personally, on my standard for if it's a big thing is if little children are hurt. That's my, my standard. If little children are hurt, then it's a big deal, and we're going to do something about it. But everything else can really be worked out, so it's not so bad. You know, when life gets tough, and it will, it will for each and every one of us, try not to complain. Because there's always somebody who's going to have it more tough than you have it. You have to learn to lead yourself, and you need to be a good follower. And that term follower is maybe not a term that you're used to, but following means that you have to be listening to your supervisor or somebody who's over you, who's telling you that you have to have things to do. And a good follower is not the person that hears something and then goes into a room and starts 
complaining to all of their all of their subordinates. You when somebody gives you something to do, then you do it. If you feel like you can't do it, then you go in a room and you discuss that with your supervisor. But you don't go around complaining about it. That's what good is that going to do? That that really deteriorates your morale. And you must be able to receive and execute commands as well as give them. Now, when we're in the battlefield, when we're in, a, in the midst of an emergency, sometimes we have to direct how things are doing. And so you might be barking out orders at someone. But day to day, when we're in a, in a, a normal kind of situation, you, we really need to be looking at um, being motivational. You have to be able to figure out how do you motivate people so they're going to do the right thing. And people should follow you not because you directed them to, but because you're competent, effective, trustworthy, and because your character commands that kind of respect. So seek out ways to develop your leadership. Leadership is what, what employers today are looking for. They want people who can step up and lead. Being decisive, you have to learn how to make a decision. You, you make those decisions on your instinct, your gut and your training. And I can promise you, some people, I have worked with people who have to have 100% of the information. You will never have 100% of the information. You have to learn how to make a decision on maybe 50, 75% of it. And just do something, just get started. So you might not be right, but there are very few decisions that are life-threatening that, that if you make the wrong decision, people are going to be hurt. My, I have a personal motto. My motto is lead, follow, or get out of the way. So that's, a, that's a, a way, the way that I look at, at life. Um, you know, everything we do in the military comes from a high level of quality. And quality is a term that we talk about all the time. So it might be that you're programming a computer it might be that you're flying a jet, or fixing a jet, or it might mean that you're scrubbing a toilet. Whatever you're doing, whatever task you have been assigned to do, you do the very best you can, no matter how insignificant you may think that is. And you're going to find that when you go to work. You're going to find that there are some things that you wonder, why in the world am I doing this? It's been a task, and it might be a test. I'd like to end my comments with um, some, it's comments from a commencement speech that Admiral William McRaven, a former commander of U.S. Special Forces Operation Command and a Navy SEAL for 36 years provided. And it's about starting your day by making your bed. He says, it's such a simple task, but if you make your bed each day, you have accomplished that first task of the day. And it gives you a small sense of pride and sets the day to complete another task and another and another. So making you your bed reminds you that it's really about the small things in life that make a difference. And if you can't do the little things right, then you'll never be able to do the big things right. So just think about it. If you have a really bad day, you come home to a bed that's made, that you made, and it gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be even better. I wish you great success throughout your, your career, and thank you so much for honoring veterans today. Brigadier General, thank you very much. Attention to detail, high standards. I think I'm going to make my bed tomorrow. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dan Schmidt. Dan is a native of Topeka and served in the United States Air Force from 1971 to 1992 and earned 14 campaign ribbon, ribbons and medals, three from Vietnam. He earned both the Non-Commissioner Officer of the Year Award and Senior Non-Commissioned Officer of the Year Award and instigated critical quality control protocols that are still used by the U.S. Air Force to this day. 
After leaving the U.S. Air Force, Dan earned his MBA from Washburn University. He worked for the City of Topeka, Security Benefit Group, Topeka Technical College, before managing community education, continuing education for Washburn University, um, 10 years on the main campus and five years at the technical campus, before retiring in June 2016. We're honored that Dan is willing to share with us his unique and personal experiences during the Vietnam War. Thank you. Sisters, I'm glad to be back. Thank you. The day by history, thank you. Very nice. I appreciate that. Um, just uh, to clarify a little bit more, School of Business is asked me to come back and teach classes. So I'm back at Worsford again on a part time basis. I'm still fishing in the summer. So <laughs> have a good time. Again, I'm honored. I was asked last year, I'm honored again this year. Uh, I'm going to tell you my story, we'll give a little history of it, uh, kind of a there back experience. And those who uh, help you, you don't have to say. Go ahead. Slide, please. So, to talk about my story, my story of recovery, uh, we need to look at the history. PTSD, and then again, think of climate of the time. So, we look at shell shock, World War II, that's what it's called. Have a name. Palpatine, World War II. PTSD is a fine burst of it. Unfortunately, it goes from Vietnam to the present. Okay, let's, next slide, please. So let's talk about shell shock. <coughs> studies were done, and every every theater, everything we do, we do studies. So we did studies on the effects of war on the soldiers. So World War One, we looked at shell shock. And we were Some of the symptoms: uncontrollable diarrhea, unrelenting. Uh, soldiers who bayoneted people in the face developed ticks. Uh, soldiers who stabbed their enemy in the stomach developed severe cramps. Sniper with blind. These are all symptoms. These are all symptoms we looked at. Uh, let's not forget the terrifying nightmares, sometimes called night terrors. This is all documented. Slide, please. So now we get to battle fatigue. We have a great, great definition up here. Please read it on your own. You're in the trenches, wherever you are. Your friends are dying. You could be next. You have to kill the enemy to survive. The very last sentence. Because of how unique, uh, it's really hard to understand what you've endured because of how unique this. Everything's different. It's such a flexible environment. Okay? But the key word at the very end, in the scribes of horror. You don't know if you're going to survive. It's not much harder. Yeah, yeah. The Audie Murphy, hero. I don't know if you've seen his movies or not. Great man. I remember the experience as I do a nightmare. A demon seemed to be in my body. You'll hear me refer to demons in the future. This is what I'm talking about. We come back with our demons. Slide, please. Balfetig, again, World War II. Shell shock was changed to Balfetig. Let's change it. We're doing some more studies on it. Advances in medicine. Understanding by the leaders. That's the key right there. The leaders finally realized this is an illness. You know, it's an uh, emotional wound defined by uh, Frederick Hansen. And if it's a wound, it's a study. We can find a cure. We can find some type of cure. Okay? Yes. So how are we going to do this? We have an idea. We know what's going on. We see some, some studies. So let's make it work. Let's test these possibilities. So we took our mentals. We called mentals in. Took them back behind enemy lines where they could be pulled up if needed. There's a breakthrough. World War II. Gave them three days, a little R and R time. Get this, clean clothes, a bed, safe environment, and 57% returned within three to five days. Okay. One point, just under 1.4 million soldiers 
were treated and actually released for psychiatric reaction for whatever reason. Couldn't take it. Thanks a lot, please. So now we come to Vietnam, Korea, and we all look at PTSD. This is the requirements. You know, for at least one month, you have flashbacks, you have bad dreams. Avoidance is huge. Avoidance, contact. Easily startled. Drop a fork, you fall on the table. These kind of things. Okay. Uh, the very last one, trouble remembering traumatic events, I buried those in my head. I just, I just let them go. I didn't think I could ever see them. And then they pop up. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. And you have a low self-esteem. No disrespect. Okay. Do you know anyone who might have these symptoms? You don't have to be a veteran. Okay. Please, sorry. So as we develop our techniques for study, we look at many factors play a part of a person who develops this PTSD. What are the risk factors? We'll show those in a moment. Resilient factors. We see those as well. As we note to the next slide. What are your risk factors? What do you have in your background that makes you hurt? Have you seen a dangerous event? Are you afraid of getting hurt? You have to get hurt. Have you seen a dead body? How bad is that? Regardless of who you are. What happened when you were a child? See something going on there. Feel helpless. So forth. Little no social events or action support. No one's to help you. You think we have these problems today? What's the first thing you do at high school? They bring the counselors in that afternoon. This is why. <laughs> Research has shown us that the faster we address these issues, the less they have for you to dwell on. And you get out in the open. And once it's in the open, once that demon's out there, you'll find a coping mechanism of some sort. Okay? Extra stress, loss of job, loss of loneliness, loss of family. Okay? Then you might have a little mental health or substance abuse. That would definitely be able to lead to slide, please. So resilient factors. What do I make me get through this? Number one, support. Gotta have support. Friends, family, you know, schools, beginning. You know. Finding a support group that helps you. I sought out fellow veterans. Vietnam veterans only. That's what I sought out. I have to feel good about what I did. Kind of hard. Okay. Deep breath. Positive coping. Don't drink. Don't do drugs. Don't help. And then act responsibly. Sorry. All right. Let's take a look now. Let's look at growing up, 1960s, 70s. Can you read that? John F. Kennedy, 1960, president, Catholic, following Ten Commandments. I was nine. He was elected. We had good moral fiber. Okay? But after 63, President Kennedy died. He was, he was uh, assassinated. Linda Bain Johnson became the president, signed in the Civil Rights Act, 64. Riots ensued. I was 13. So I see a timeline here? Okay. President Johnson inherited the Vietnam War. He did all the conspiracy theories and the He inherited the war. He chose to continue it. He followed the French. And then in 1968, Bobby Caddy, Martin Luther King were assassinated. So I was 17 in high school, junior. All of a sudden, our moral leaders were dying. What's going on? Okay. Again, getting on more. Heats up. You know, we see, uh, see it on television. 1970 military draft of the dishes. 1970. You watched on television. Big roll. Came around and pulled out a little capsule. They had your birthday. And that was your number. That's how it worked. It's actually televised lottery system to see where you were drafted or not. We also saw that I was 19 at the time. Not even no updates on the news. Body counts, everything was going on. 
When I returned, I could not watch the news. I just can't. Okay? But the more protests. Were you aware that in 1970, that's on the floor here, KU shut down early and the town put under curfew? They put barricades were put across into the town. Lawrence made the cover of Time magazine. It was the title of Bloody Kansas in 1970. It seemed like forever ago for some of you younger. Wasn't that long ago for me. Okay. And at the very end, his son returned his home to the valley. The country itself seemed to get a bit more better. Like this. Now I have a little history. Where am I? What's going on here? You see? 9, 13, 17. Right in the prime of life. What happens? So in 1969, I graduated from, from uh, Hayden High School, Catholic High School, with uh, hopefully my moral ethic fiber. Uh, Letterman crossed country wrestling track, received scholarship for it. Thank you. I'm proud of that. I was working uh, in a hospital at Terry Divorce Firm, and I worked in a lab. I worked part time, I'm sure, a lot of you relate to that. I was stuck by a needle, became extremely ill, really ill, almost died. I don't know what's wrong with me. Okay, different, we have different things now, and this is why. Because there was things like that. Uh, that's the first time I found me to attend college. Okay. Uh, my parents didn't know about medical calls or medical tech. So as it turned out, I, I missed, I failed quite a few classes. And as such, became an elder to come back to school. I did become eligible for the draft. That's how it's done. I like that. That's fine. Fine, please. The one thing you didn't want to be lucky about is have a low number on the draft. So, lucky or unlucky, I had number four. Number four says, hey, I want to go somewhere whether I want to or not. You know what I would do? I said, I'm going to talk to my dad, talk to my uncles. They were all in the service, they were very supportive. Don't go army, don't go where uh, don't go where they went. That left me with the Air Force. Well, I can't swim so, very well. <laughs> so I went Air Force. Hopefully we didn't have to ditch over water. Okay. So I enlisted the Air Force, and I, my AFSC was security forces. I lived in security forces. They were transferred but at that moment, security forces. And being an overachiever, three layers in track, testing and so forth, Dressing uh, basic and all was a, was a piece, piece of cake. Security training was a piece of cake. That's what I taught the class got to go to. You guessed it, combat school. I got to go to combat school. All right? So now let's look at my adventures, so to speak, in 1972. Found myself on a C-130 headed for Thailand, the top of the Air Force base, to be exact. My mission was to seek and find enemy movements along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Okay. The trail ran along the Vietnamese, Laos, and Cambodian borders. Okay, we were in direct support of Vietnam, Vietnam a lot, direct support. Although, I may have heard about it in the 70s, but rarely did we talk about going to Laos, Cambodia. 30 years later, uh, of course I know, he uh, finally got his, his awards. His family got recognized, and he received the Purple Heart. But we were out around in country, so maybe almost 30 years ago that to happen. So you can see, it took a long time for Vietnam folks to be acknowledged. So to get on with the story, soldiers in the Great War Center on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. If you haven't seen the movies yet, uh, the uh, Vietnam story. What we do, we go out for 10 days. We do seek and find missions. We find the enemy, we plot their force. We go, we come back, get picked up, we turn over to intel. Third time, we go back and assist. As advisors, okay. In 72, yeah, in 72, yeah. Were we ever discovered? Did we lose men? Yes, we did. What else happened? We get a little R&R &R after our 10 day adventure. We get some time to cover it. We had a uh, incident where our soldiers being killed in their sleep. If you're in your room by yourself, you, you, you might die. I, I suspected one of our friendlies, our friendlies, was involved in this. And we I couldn't prove it. I it took my suggestion for it. I told what's going on. They followed the person, they finally caught him with a knife, killing one of our one of our soldiers. 
You will get back dry and in shock. That's your kidney. Okay, so a lot of things going on there. So I have that in my, in my that case of demons here. All right. I opened an outside door to go to dinner one time. King Cobra popped up out of the grass and chased me. From chasing me. I don't know if you ever had that. King Cobras are almost 18 feet long. They spray a bucket and then they fall on you. But they were falling on me. My friend had a shovel and knocked it down and he killed me. I came this close. Kind of a cobra hit me in the chest. We had no any venom. We were at kind of a remote site. I would have died. Okay. So what I'm saying is, at that time, on several occasions, my fellow soldiers died and we faced that. We faced that and we had to live through it. How about the Great Homecoming? Not only was our, uh, talk about that, the Great home Homecoming, or if you need any help, you'll be discharged. Had a family, had support. So I, so I came back, I returned, okay? Well, on arrival, I was actually to all the areas. Early morning, two to three in the morning, under President Nixon at the time, we bring in the folks, bring them back so that no one ever had that for body count. Who all was supporting that no more? Bring us in and I put us in a 10 foot cage. Big old cage with a cable around it. It was made very, it was a chain link fence. Made very, uh, the officer in charge said, if you need help, you will get help. We will send you over to the hospital where you will be probably given drugs and discharge. Medical discharge. We're not going to help you. You're just going to give us drugs and send us on our way. You know what? I'm fine, Doc. Send me up. Let me sign the form. Let me go home. I'm in, I'm in way too far. So I told him I was fit. I'm, fit. I'm ready to go back. I can face this. I can do this. You told me. You told me I, I didn't have to have any help. I could do it on my own. Well, I flew commercial aircraft. That was a mistake. The attention of the uh, was spit on you, probably baby killers, baby eaters. I never heard that before. I was doing. I had garbage thrown on me. Okay. The nation did not support what we did. Um, here's what Americans served in a few watch when they were called by the draft. We followed the orders by America and we did our duty. And when we returned, sometimes landing in the States less than 48 hours after being in the thick of war. We were blamed and vilified for following the order of the No victory parades. So how are you? So who did I seek out? My fellow Vietnam veterans. In the service, I had no issues. I had fellow Vietnam first. I worked. <laughs> I really had four hours sleep a night. I worked and worked and worked. Just so I could sleep. I wake up in, in, in night, night trips, things like this, but I had to face them. So says there, face your demons. Um, there's other reasons not to. Oh, I, I'm a man, I don't need to talk. You told me I was a man, okay? I could do it with my support. Group. And psychiatrists, you must be kidding me. No one goes to psychiatrists unless they're really ill and need to go home. That's the attitude. Once I got out of the service, I didn't have my support group. They didn't want to talk to you, they knew about it. So the people I knew were in different cities, different continents. They know what to do. One night, my wife tried to wake me, and I strangled her. She hit me in the shoulder, and I just came straight up. Remember I told you people were dying? Okay. So I stopped. I got stopped. I went immediately to the VA. Stopped to a different group. Just stopped. Everything under control took me a while. I want to say a lot in a while, okay? Go get the help, okay? Uh, everyone needs help. You can't. If you think you can do it on your own, you're wrong. You're very wrong, okay? I like the last line that I put up here. I was lucky to receive the help I needed without her getting work. I had up to it. There are ways to release my demons, and the very key is you learn how to cope. You learn how to cope with the new and stuff forward that you don't even know you have. You don't even know you have, okay? Very dangerous, okay? Like I said, you don't even know they're there. Um, the, the one about the cobra, 
I buried that for almost 25 years, and then all of a sudden it came in place. Can I explain it? How do you repress? You repress bad stuff. Okay? This goes to diet. I repressed it for almost 25 years. Okay? So it can happen. Any given time, discussion, I don't know if I triggered us to brought that steak back. Although I do know I'm afraid of steaks. No, I hate steaks. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have some issues. But I resolve the issues. Okay? I know how to react in a positive manner. Before I reacted in a very negative manner. I'd be the guy getting out of the car with the sledgehammer, you know? I mean, that would be me. I don't put guns in my car for a reason, okay? <laughs> reason no guns are in my car, and the guns I have at home are locked, okay? So, a lot of things. But it's been a positive. If you learn how to cope in a positive manner, you know, in a positive manner, maybe call me, I'll come sit with you. Positive. Don't have down. Be positive about it. Slide. We'll call this demons one and demons two. There's going to be two slides on the demons. And I'm going to explain to uh, uh, this one. I'm going to go Pat Bell. He's from Vietnam. He's eight years my senior. He was there in 1966. Uh, he served at Intel. His job was to get in helicopters and fly over enemy, enemy formation and take pictures and bring them back into Melbourne. That was his job. Okay. Next slide, please. This is demons two. I did not see any of these when they were painted. They were all 50 years old. So what it says in the fine print in there, his call sign was Dark Eagle 1. And underneath it, I want to go home. Let me explain this story how he did not face the demons. And that's, I want to bring that forward. Um, we met at my aunt's funeral about five years ago in Texas. Uh, his nephew started asking about Vietnam. Very inappropriate questions. Very inappropriate. Who'd you kill? What'd you do? How many bites? Very, those are very appropriate questions for anyone. We never ask those questions. And uh, being a good Catholic family, we had our wake. We were drinking a little bit, and I had to take the nephew outside and discuss with him how not to ask questions and take on a full side and find out what's going on with him. What's going on with him? We talked for an hour and a half to two hours. Picture. Previous slide. Present the photograph show. He was doing this shot right here, doing that particular shot. Now what happened was, they had built a new hoose for them to live in, and some Japanese would come, to come in, and they had blown the hoose, his entire squad had just died. Had just died, the entire squad. He had survived the deal. He, he, was in, he was downtown, in the Jeep. Little kids used to run up and throw grenades in the jeeps and blow up the jeep. So they started carrying sidearms. He had to shoot a little child. He had that to live with. Like children. Yeah. He had that to live with. And he never faced his demons. When he returned, he went home and talked to his, his dad, who was upset with him because he was MIA. And, he, and his dad said, You should never have got MIA. You should have killed yourself. Oh. What? Yeah, well, don't say that. Uh, he went to Canada. He lived his life in Canada. He could not stay living in the U.S. with his family and his nation. Rejected him. We're supposed to be. He died. All right. Purpose. Seek help. Okay. Seek assistance. I did two years ago. I'll do it again. Okay. Um, I hope I show you the importance of getting that help. Get that help. Get assistance. You can you can face your issues. Last slide. Okay. Last slide. Man up. Okay. Seek assistance. The hotline up here, btsdhotline.com, is for any individual. For Augustine Veterans today, but any individual wants to have it. Okay. Press one. That's for the veterans. Press two for someone else. Press three. Press four. This is a nationalized hotline call. Okay. What's that? Not fear. 
Don't be afraid. Live and not to have fear for the next moment. It's important to do that. And you have earned the right to be whole again. Thank you.
just my children and my wife. Thank my lucky star to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that.
Look at funny man. That's not bad. I, yeah, that's not bad at all. 20 minutes for 20 minutes. They, don't, they didn't used to have that. No, I would have been <laughs> up, up the tree. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, loose the news. Loose the news.